So I'm going to be looking at the liner shipping fleet repositioning problem. It's an awkwardly long title for a paper, but I'll explain what it means. So we have this problem where initially we have a collection of vessels which are providing some scheduled ser service. So for instance, it might be over here, so that's in the Far East, so this is like a bit, this is like the Pacific Ocean in the middle there, and that's where the, the shipping service is initially. And we might be wanting to reposition these vessels to provide a shipping service over here. So that's the that's on the coast of, of South America instead. And it's a big and expensive problem because our vessels here, for instance, say we're in the hot America there to there, so the pigs can't go at one point and drop it off at another. But they're being paid to do that. The moment they stop doing that paid work, as soon as they have to cross the Pacific and get to some new port over here to start a new service over there, we're not making any money, we're not carrying any cargo. We're just having to pay the crew and we have to pay a lot of new fuel to reposition the vessel. So it's an interesting challenge about how can we reposition vessels so we get them from some initial service to some common location on the goal service. So let's start simple, as a, as a good philosophy, when you're trying to write a planning model, let's start simple. Now obviously it's going to be a temporal model because sailing from here to here is going to take a different amount of time to sailing from all the way over here to all the way over here. So it's going to be a temporal planning problem, it's going to be a time at least. But what, if we keep it simple, what do we really need at the bare bones level? Well, I'd say we have three actions. So we need some action that represents that the vessel has left its initial service, so it's stopped doing what it wants to do to start with, and that's the point at which this repositioning action for that vessel has officially begun. Once you've phased it out of its initial service, then we say, well, we need to sail somewhere from, from the sea, from, from one place to another. It might make some intermediate stops. But this is a sort of classic move action in planning. Like it's just like logistics, it's not like anything um, that you haven't seen before. It's just a sail action, move from there to there. And then, once you've got it there, well, the vessels can phase in. The key detail is, they must all eventually converge on sailing to <coughs> the same port, and then they all must phase in at this port. And once they're phased in, repositioning officially ends. So our goal state is to have phased in every single vessel at the same port. Well, let's look at some actions. So here's what phase out looks like, otherwise known as leave the vessel's initial service. So the three conditions are that the vessel is on its initial service, so it hasn't phased out yet. You can see the first thing we do is, is delete that. We also have this precondition that the vessel may phase out at that port. So this is some sort of placeholder to say, well, it hasn't phased out yet, but it is there. And then if we apply this action, well, the vessel is now at that port, which means because it's at there, we can start to sail it and manip manipulate it. And we also mark that it's in transit. So again, that bank code is the vessel's initial position. And these are going to be the preconditions of the sail action. So we can sail the vessel if it's in transit, and we have to know where it currently is. So let's have a look at the sale action. I've called this sale incomplete because this isn't quite complete. This isn't all the detail we're going to eventually need, but it will do for now. First thing to observe is that its duration is variable. So there's no exact one time you can say it does take 100 hours to sail from here to here because it depends on how quickly you run the engines on the vessel. And the interesting thing about that is that it affects how much fuel you're going to use. But even though we're not going to think about fuel, we can still say, well, the duration is in this region here. So it's greater than or equal to some minimum. We can't run the engines below a certain minimum speed. And it is less than or equal to some maximum. And the three conditions. First, this one here. Sailing has to be allowed from one port to another. So for people whose hobby is not the obscure rules of, of, of maritime shipping, quite often we have these things called cabotage restrictions. And it's to stop foreign vessels offering a domestic cargo service. 
So if I sail over to America on, on a British ship, that might be fine, I might be able to dock in New York, but then I can't sail from New York to another port in America because I will be competing with the domestic cargo shipping firms. So sailing allowed essentially will say more or less you're allowed to sail from anywhere in one country to somewhere else in a different country. And then at the bottom here is your classic move style action. So at the start, we're not at where we were. At the end, we are at the destination location. So the final thing, we've phased out, we've saved, now we need to phase in. Well, because we have this constraint that all vessels must phase in at the same port, we have a choice. So let's say, this is just one way of modeling it, the first vessel to phase in gets to choose where all the others then have to go to. The planner is making the decision, so we can think of it that way. We have this extra fact as a precondition of phasing in, that block phase in start means we are ready to start our phase in block, i.e. nothing else has phased in yet. And you can see we delete that straight away. And we also add this extra fact to say that the first phase in port was wherever it was we just phased in. So you can say this vessel that's going to phase in at this port and the parameters, if we do that, but we're good to note that the first phase in port was wherever we've just phased in. So then the second version of phase in is everything which phases in after the first one has to use this version of the action. And you can see this first phase in port is then a precondition of the action. So this one has block phase in start, which you then delete, so you can only use this once. But this one has first phase in port to say, well, okay, you can phase in, but it's got to be at the same place where the first vessel phased in. And then the rest of it is, as you'd expect, if you do phase in, you're no longer in transit and you have completed your phasing operation. So here's what a plan might look like in that domain. So we're going to phase out the two vessels from, from their initial ports. We're going to sail them to where they are to some common destination port. The first one's going to phase in, and then the next one's going to phase in. So there are different phasing actions, but it's still ultimately phasing in, just dressed up a bit differently. So that's a good starting point for this problem. What's missing there? Well, there's a saying in London that buses come in threes. Actually, they come in twos if you look at the mathematics. But we have the same issue here with vessels. We're trying to set up a new weekly service. So we want to be able to say, at um, some point in, in, in the week, one of our vessels will arrive to take things on the schedule service, which will go from A to B to C to D, to E to F and that to A again. So we, we need to find this guarantee to our customers. If all the vessels arrive in the same week, we've not provided that guarantee because they've all arrived at once and then there's nothing going to be coming in the next week. So we say, all the vessels must phase in, but also they must phase in, not in the same week. How can we do this in PDDL? So this is where we need a little bit more of the language here. PDDL is quite a, a sizable language. As a rule of thumb, keep it simple, use as little as you can get away with, but in this <coughs> specific problem, it is meaningless to try and solve it without having to use time initial literals. Well, what are Time initial literals. Well, the facts in the initial state, as you've already seen, they're true initially, as the name suggests, they're true at time zero. Timed initial literals are timed. So they are associated with the time at which they become true or become false. So phase in week open, we're going to say nothing has phased in in this week. And that's going to become true at one week intervals. So 168 is 24 hours multiplied by 7. That's 24 hours multiplied by 14. So that's the start of the second week of operations. That's the start of the third week of operations, and so on. And then we make a very small multiplication to the domain and say phasing in is going to delete this fact. So phasing week open becomes a precondition of the phasing action, just shown phasing block here, but we do on the phasing first as well. When we apply this action, we then delete 
phase in week open. And if we want to phase in something else, what we are then forced to do is wait for enough time to pass before the next one of these timed initial literals kicks in. So we phase in something in week one, so at time 168, we then have to wait until at least time 336, because that's the point at which we get back this fact, phase in week open, to be able to phase in something else. So that's a fairly small modification to the model, and it's a good use of that language feature. The second thing that's missing is I just kind of waved my hands and glossed over the fact that as the vessels are here, um, a vessel can phase out of its initial service at this port. The problem is when a vessel's on its initial service, it's actually doing work. It's actually sailing around from one place to another. So it will load up the cargo, sail away, dock at another port, unload its cargo, load up the cargo, sail away, and so on and so forth. When can we actually then phase out? Well, it's quite simple. First of all, the vessel must be in port, and it must be empty. So you can't just swipe someone else's cargo and sail off and saying, I'm repositioning now. The cargo which you thought was going to be delivered to, to Indonesia is now going to go to Peru. Sorry about that. So you've got to be empty. Thankfully, we know where these things are, because we have our scheduled operations <laughs> the vessel, we have our timetable which they're following. The solution is, again, we can use time initial literals, and this vessel may phase out itself becomes a time initial literal. So if I show you what's going to look like in the initial state, at time 16, so 16 hours into the week, we have a short window of opportunity when vessel north is at this port here. And then shortly afterwards, it's no longer at that port there. So that's, it, it's point one just to, just to essentially give you some luck. It's got 10 minutes there maybe where it's going to be empty. If you want to phase it out, you make that call right then. Otherwise, too late, we're going to start using it for something else. And you can see, so time 16, we have a window of opportunity to phase out here. Time 61, we have a window of opportunity to phase out at a different port. At time 158, and so on and so forth. Because it's a scheduled service and because it's following a tour, you can also see that at time 16, we are at this first port. We come back at time 520, so if you missed the boat there, then if you hang around for long enough, it will come back. And we have this list of timed initial literals for every single vessel based on its initial itinerary, saying where it is at what time. So an example plan now, slightly closer to reality, as you can see now we're phasing out. Well, this isn't at time zero anymore. It's phasing out at the time when the vessel was available to phase out at that port. And the new thing, as I mentioned, the phasing in has got to come in separate weeks. This is slightly more subtle, but in the first case, we phased in the vessel about time 600, and the next one at time 650. Well, now you can see there's a much bigger gap there between phasing in the first one you have to wait until the end of the week before you can phase in the next one. How does the plan actually reason with timed initial literals? Well, there are two options. One is you reduce it to the problem you've already solved and use dummy actions. So you can take your simple temporal problem and say, well, if we have a special action which represents the timed initial literal at time 16, when we say when that action goes into the simple temple problem, if it's a time x, we just say the lower bound on its time is x and the upper bound on its time is x. Or in other words, the amount of time between time zero, the special vertex of time zero, and that step is exactly 16. So that's fixing it to be rigidly in time. So the planner can't choose what these time initial literals are. So it's got to respect whatever time has been assigned to it. And then with these dummy actions, we can say, in any given state, if so far you've only applied the time initial literals, which were due up to time, say, 15, then you have a dummy action which corresponds to applying the ones at time 16, and then from that state you'll be able to apply the ones at 16.1, from that state it might be 17, etc. So you can put an order on them and say, in any given state, the next time initial literal, which hasn't yet happened yet, we can have a dummy action that says, 
okay, let's have that. And, of course, to make sure that we're not going to have time initial literals that undo the goal, we have an extra condition in the goal state that say all the time initial literals have happened. And basically, we make these fairly small modifications to the planner, so we turn it back into actions, we have a rule in which you can apply these actions, and we've said how to manage their temporal constraints, you can plan as before. The drawback for doing that, though, is that in something like the line of ship and fleet reposition problem, Remember, we have 200 or so time initial literals because we have these itineraries for each vessel, we have the phasing opportunities, and so on and so forth. That means a plan, instead of actually comprising 12 actions or so, behind the scenes it might have to comprise 212 actions just to have applied all the dummy actions to get you to the right point in time to be able to do what it is you want to do. So, a slightly better idea is to actually analyze the problem and look for design patterns. So this is the idea of, well, we can make a domain-independent planner, but we can look at the domains which people write and what seems to appear again and again, and sort of abstract out the ideas and do something smarter with it. So the first design pattern to plan initial literals that we actually identified in this work was this thing called a recurrent time window. So at time 10, we get some fact. At time 20, we delete it. Time 40, it comes back again. At time 48, it goes away. And so on and so forth. So we have windows of opportunity. And if F, this fact, is, it is not added or deleted by any real action in the domain, then it's essentially just something which the time initial literals are controlling. Which means we can actually abstract out the specifics and say that any action with a precondition F has to go in one of these windows of opportunity. Because F, F has to be true, so either it comes in the window from 10 to 20, or it comes in the window from 40 to 48, or etc, etc, etc. And that's it, we can actually have a planner, when it's coming up in this plan, it doesn't specifically have to care about these anymore. It's, it, it can say, so long as we can deal with these temporal constraints, which I'll come back to a bit later on, then we'll go over, we just plan, we can put that action in the plan and trust that some time stamp to be chosen for it, but it's within one of these windows of opportunity. So there's no need for dummy actions in this case. The second design pattern is related to the first, but if an action goes in a given window, it then blocks off that window for anything else. So imagine we had a piece of machinery which became available once a day, and if we used it, it was then locked up for the, for the rest of the day. It would be the same issue as that. In this specific problem, it's phasing in. So if we're going to phase in the vessel in a given week, well, that fact F becomes true, and that vessel then actually consumes that fact F. So it's going to be false from then on. It only becomes true again next week. So we might have several actions which want F, so actions A and B here. And we might have the same windows of opportunity as the previous slide. So the previous slide, we, we would just say, a comes between um, between 10 and 20, or it comes between 40 and 48, etc. But now we'd also say, well, this action A and this action B, which both want to be in one of these windows, at most one of these two constraints here can be true. So either neither A nor B is in the 10 to 20 window, or at most one of them is. So either A is in there or B is in there but certainly you can't have both in there, because they're both in there, but they both want to consume that fact. Logically, that's not sound. But again, we've abstracted out the detail, and we can say we can put both of these actions in the plan, and we don't particularly care which window they go in, so long as there are enough windows of opportunity to go around, and so long as maybe some other side conditions hold. But essentially, we can abstract out the detail, and either A could go in that 10 to 20 window and B could go into the 40 to 48 window, or vice versa. We needn't actually commit at this point to what's going to happen there. What's missing? Part three. Slightly annoying, but when you talk to people, you keep finding more and more things where they say, well, actually, what we really want to be able to do is model this. So you end up adding more and more detail to your model. This part of the pie chart here, this is the percentage of the world's oil usage 
which is attributable to international shipping on the seas. So excluding aviation, this is how much oil are we actually using with cargo ships. Cargo ships are actually a pretty efficient way, in terms of miles to the gallon, of moving things around the world, but we move a lot of things around the world using, using um, vessels on the, on the sea. And with rising oil costs, it's actually increasingly important. Um, historically, what they, they would say is, well, we're doing the repositioning, it's costing us money to have a vessel out of service, full steam ahead, let's get to the destination as quickly as possible. The problem with sailing quickly is you end up having to spend a lot more money on fuel. How much more? Well, it might be a factor of five, say. So we sell at a minimum duration, so we sell as slowly as possible, <coughs> sorry, as quickly as possible, but we might have a high cost here. If we sell at maximum duration, so we run the engines at their theoretical slowest speed, um, then we have a much lower cost. You can see that's about a factor of three. So that, that duration parameter of the action, so how long is it going to take, has a big effect on the cost of operation. And again, it's reasonably linear. In this instance, it actually is reasonably linear. It might, might even have to approximate it too badly. It's, it's not bad to say it's linear in this case. How are we going to model that in PDL? Well, this is where some of the optimization features of the language come in. We can actually say that the cost is not constant, so it's not increased cost one, increased cost three. Increased cost by some function of the duration of the action. So there's a choice about the duration of the action, that choice can impact the cost. So in effect, the cost becomes time dependent. So the time we take to sail affects the cost of the operations. And because PDL is written in prefix form, this looks slightly hideous. Um, we're going to increase the cost by some fixed amount plus the product of our duration of the action and this variable cell cost here. I'll display it with a graph, that will make a lot more sense. So this is how we do the maths there. So this is a straight line, so it has the formula y equals x plus c, or in our specific instance, our cost is the gradient, so we're going to call that gradient variable sale cost, it's a negative constant. Variable sale cost times the duration, because that's the value of our x-axis, plus some constant. Where does that constant come from? Well, you do what you used to do in, in maths classes in school. You, you get a build out and you extend the line to the axis and find the y-axis intercept. And we're going to call that the fixed sail cost. So the cost of sailing the vessel is some fixed sail cost plus the gradient times the duration. And this variable sail cost, the gradient is a negative value. So the longer we take, the cheaper it gets but we still have to only put the duration between this minimum and this maximum. So the, du the duration can't just go to, go to infinity because eventually you, you would actually start to get negative costs. So it's only well defined within this interval from minimum to maximum. And again, this nice looking formula, you kind of bash it into prefix form and you end up with this PDL. So I'm just fairly confident that this is the prefix form representation of that, then you can follow what's going on here. But what else is missing? Well, unfortunately, fuel is not the only cost we have. Because if vessels are, re if vessels are repositioning, then we're not being paid to do any useful work. Which, but we're still having to actually pay the crew. So there's what's called the hotel cost. So it's their wages plus bed and board subsistence, essentially. So for each hour between phasing out, in, so between phasing out the vessel and phasing it back in again, we have to pay that cost. It's a function which depends on how many crew the vessel has. So it might be different for different vessels. Which now gives us quite an interesting consequence that we have opposing costs because if you want to sail really slowly, then you'll save loads of money on fuel, but you'll have spent it on the hotel cost. And if you sail really quickly, you'll spend the money on the fuel, but you'll have saved on the hotel cost. So there's an interesting trade off there in finding some balance between one and the other. How can we actually model my like PDL though with this hotel cost? It's actually not too hard. It's, it's some quite nice looking maps in this instance. We're going to have a, an action called hotel cost calc for some vessel. At the start, it's going to give us some fact how long we phase out. So we're going to say 
if you want to phase out, you've got to have started this action first. And then once you've started this action, it has this effect, increase the cost by the product of the hotel cost of that vessel, so how much per hour does it keep us to, to, to feed and pay the crew on that vessel, multiplied by the duration of this action. What is the duration of this action? Well, it's as small as you can make it, but you have got to phase in before you can actually end the action. So you must start hotel cost calc before you can phase out, and you must phase in before you can actually end it. What would the plan look like for one vessel then? Well, we'd have this giant envelope around it called hotel cost calc. Inside that we'd have to phase out, then we'd have to sail, then we'd have to phase in again. And we might have gaps here. It's, it's not ideal, but we might have gaps, because it might be that the cheapest thing to do is to phase it out of its initial service here, and then it, you've got to pay the hotel cost. But if we let it sail off and continue on its initial service, it might be going in completely the wrong direction. So then we'd actually end up spending more money on the sailing to get it back again. So it's where we, we have one of these trade-offs in this problem. But that's what the plan would look like. So we have this hotel cost calc, which starts before the phase out, and it finishes after the, the end of that phase in action there. So this timestamp plus of 16 plus that duration of 600.03, you can see it takes you to just after phase in first. Now, in the simple temple case, just dealing with the simple temple problem, we would say well, we're going to do each action at its earliest possible time, because that allows us to do things quickly. In this case, it's actually a bad idea to do things quickly, because sailing quickly costs money. Well, it might be a bad idea, because sailing quickly costs money, but sailing quickly sales saves your hotel cost. How, in the general case, can we deal with this problem of having opposing time-dependent costs? There's no one-size-fits-all solution. Well, again, we look at what's going on in other communities, and um, one nice use we can make here is of linear programming. So linear programming is given some linear constraints, so some constraints within a linear normal form, find an assignment of values to the variables, but minimizes some objective functions, so some cost function. Now simple temporal problems comprise constraints in linear normal form. All these constraints here are linear. So in principle, I can give this to an LP solver and it can cope with it. So all I then need to do is, as well as giving it the temporal constraints, to give it the cost constraints. So the hotel cost is the product of the hotel cost of our vessel times <coughs> the amount of time that has passed between the start of the hotel cost and the end of it. So that's just the duration of the hotel cost count. And if I multiply out the brackets, I get that. And because hotel cost is a constant, you can see that's a linear expression. Similarly, for the cost of sailing, well, it's the fixed sail cost, it's our y-axis intercept, plus the product of the gradient and the amount of time we sailed for. And we get that's a negative constant. Our LP objective function is then to minimize the sum of our costs here. So we have to do things as cheaply as possible. So as well as integrating the planning choices with a linear programming problem, we can take that idea further and integrate with a mixed integer programming problem, where as well as the real valued variables we have in the case of an LP, we now have binary and integer variables as well. And this is a way of capturing those design patterns for timed initial literals that I mentioned earlier, so the time windows and consumed opportunities. So this requires a little bit of algebra, so I'll have to introduce some variables. So for fact f, where we have several time windows and time window k, so the k time window starts at f, f plus k and finishes at f minus k, then we add to the mixed integer program a binary variable w i k. So if that binary variable is set to 1, then that's saying that the step i, which needs fact f, is going to be in that window. If it's set to 0, then it means it's not in that window. So now we can add some constraints over these variables. The first thing we need to say is that we are going to choose one and only one window for each time step in the plan. So a given step cannot be in two non-overlapping regions at once. So we say 
for the sum between naught and n, so for all these k time window variables, binary variables, so this time step, the sum of those is one. So you have to choose one, but you can't choose more than one. And the fact that you can't choose more than one is then quite important, because when we look at writing some more constraints, we can now constrain the lower bound on this timestamp based on the window it's been put in. So if window naught has been chosen, then the lower bound on the timestamp of the variable is set to the lower bound of the timestamp on window naught, i.e. the point at which window naught begins. So you can see, so the sum again between naught and n, so for all the n windows in which we could place the step, we're going to set the lower bound on step i, so the step itself, to be the product of when that window started and then the zero one variable that says we have chosen to put it in that window. So effectively only one of these terms on the left hand side can have a non-zero binary coefficient. And that's again because as I mentioned on the left there where we say we can only choose one that's why it's important there. If we could choose more than one then this equation wouldn't work properly. So that's the lower bound. We have a very similar thing for the upper bound. So now we say the step the timestamp of the step, so the value of that step i variable, has to come less than or equal to the end of the time window it's been put in. So again, only one of these w variables is non-zero, so this right-hand side here will just evaluate to the exact endpoint of the window that the step's been put in. So that's just for your generic recurring time windows. If you remember the second design pattern, the consumed opportunities, then very simply we just write an extra constraint there. So if we have a set of steps in the plan, all of which use and consume f, we're going to call that set of steps big F. So that's the set of step indexes. And then for a slight difference now, instead of doing the sum over all the windows, we say the sum over all these steps which use f within each window. So for all k0 to n, so for each window, the sum of the action variables that use that step, well, those binary variables has to be less than or equal to one. So only one w value across any action for a given window k can be set to 1. If we tried to put more than one action to the same window then we would violate that because the sum of those would be equal to 2. So at most 1 because you don't have to use it but no more than 1. So let's have a look at an example just to clarify this. So this is the vessel may phase out constraint from our problem. So this is just a classic recurring window of opportunity. I can see we have two windows there, one which starts at 16, the other one starts at 520. I'm going to call that fact f just to keep it brief. And we're going to assume that we're working with step one. So phase out is step one of the plan. Well, in the terms I introduced in the previous slide, then those are going to be f plus and f minus. So when is the fact added and deleted at the start of a window? So it's going to be 16, 16.1, 520, 520.1. Then we instantiate our constraints. So first we can only choose one of these windows. So W10 plus W11 is equal to 1. That's fairly straightforward. This bit's a lot clearer now we've put some numbers into it. So either we come after 16 or we come after 520 based on which one of these W variables is set to 1. And we call only one of them can be set to 1. Similar thing for the upper bound. We then come either before 16.1 or before 520.1, again, depending on which one of these W variables is set to 1. So the nice thing here is that we've separated out parts of the decision making. So the planner is making the causal decisions about um, which, which vessel to move, where to move them to, and so on, will lead to the MIP, these exact decisions about which time window to use, and also these optimization decisions about how to minimize the cost of operations. The last one of these slides about what else is missing, I'm not going to go into too much detail on this today, but we also have these constraints that if the first vessel phases in in week x, the next one must phase in week x plus 1, the next one in week x plus 2, and so on, because we're trying to set the weekly surface. And again, we can write that in PDL, the smart thing to do is then to embed that into the MIP. So you would say the phasing actions must occur not just in different weeks, but in successive weeks. And you can do that with the binary variables I mentioned on the previous slide. The other way you can save money, which again we can model into planning problem, you can sell with equipment, so essentially empty shipping containers, you can put those onto your vessel, you can, make, can save some money by taking those around the world for people. And you can also sell on a service, 
So if there's a scheduled service, for instance, um, from, from one port to another, and you're in the right place at the right time, whilst you're positioning, you can take that cargo and you can do that job. And because you're then doing some paid work, it reduces your cost. And again, it's just something we, we'd use a time initial literal for when the opportunity is. And we need an action to say, I'm going to take that opportunity. It's a special version of sailing. And it would then allow us to do a plan which looked a bit like this. So we're going to phase the vessel out. We're going to sail it to some port. Once we get to that port, we're going to sail on this service. We're going to essentially do some paid work, save ourselves some cost. And then when we get to the destination, we're going to phase in there. And that's the end of the plan. So notice that we've actually got two sorts of sailing on here. So we're actually sailing to where the sail on service opportunity is. So you don't have to phase out at the sail on service opportunity. And whilst we are sailing on service, because we're doing paid work, we're no longer having to pay this hotel cost cap. So this hotel cost cap stops as soon as we start sailing on service, and it picks up just before we finish sailing on service. You can see there's a slight gap there. So we've start the hotel cost cap up again just before we finish sailing the service. So now, again, we would just, just ask the, the method to optimize the problem of the sum of the cost of this sailing action here, plus the cost of the hotel cost car on the left-hand side, plus the cost of the hotel cost car on the other side, and obviously the costs from the other vessels as well. So it's putting everything into one pot and solving them together. How well does it work? Well, we started with the scanalyzer domain in which a delete relaxation-based planning approach was competitive with a domain-specific solver. The nice thing we have here is that you can take a mixed integer programming approach where there's, where there's various forms of, of knowledge are embedded into the model, which the planner doesn't get, and we can compare it to a planning-based approach. And you can see that as we increase the size of the problem, so we add more vessels, we have more sale and service opportunities and so on. The time taken to find a solution to the problem, these are optimal um, solutions in this instance. The performance of the planner starts to outperform that of the NIP. So it's a nice result there. And it kind of bears out the fact that we're doing this separation of planning decisions and optimization decisions. So instead of just solving everything in the MIP, the, the planning approach will solve will make some of the decisions itself. But things like time windows and cost optimization, it will be bumped in the mix. So splitting the tasks of solving the problem into the two approaches which are best to solve them. And that's done automatically from the PDL model. There's no human in the loop making this happen. We have our nice abstract model in PDL, which is decomposed into what's actually needed to solve it efficiently. So as a retrospective, when writing a planning domain, start with a simple model and get it working. And this is quite useful. We actually want to try and sell planning to someone as um, a tool they might want to use. If you can come up with something which is close enough to what it is they want to solve, they'll start talking to you and they'll say, well, that's interesting. But actually, there's this extra aspect which we wish you could put in there as well. So you can go away and do that. And then you go back to them and you, you build up the complexity over time. And the nice thing about doing this is that you actually meet some interesting research questions along the way because maybe you can't efficiently do um, such a thing using planning. Maybe you can do it in PDL, but the planners aren't that effective at it. So design patterns for time <coughs> are something which are inspired by the landship and fleet repositioning problem. Since we've done that, they've been used in, in some work on satellite observation scheduling. You can imagine you can see a certain star or a certain planet at certain times of day from certain places on the world, and you're trying to, sh you're trying to schedule the operations of taking an, an, an image of that Again, it's this abstract, you've got a window of opportunity. The action to take an image of that has to come in one of those windows. Beyond that, it's an optimization question. You can then say, well, here's my plan. I want to find some minimum cost way of doing that. What else can we do in planning? Well, planning with preferences is, is something we have particular expertise on here at King's. So someone mentioned in the, in the, as a question, what sort of logics can we work with? So this is where you start to see temporal logic. So you might want to find a plan, but sometime before you get to Kings, you, you have a coffee. And this can either be a hard constraint or it can be a preference. So you can say, I would prefer plans 
which would satisfy this, this um, logical formula here. We can also do continuous numeric effects, but aren't just on cost. So we don't have to say um, our cost is, is um, dependent on time and that's it. We can also do resource production consumption. So we can say, um, if we're, for instance, filling a bucket with water, we'll let the amount of water in that bucket increase over time. And there's a tutorial on, on the web given by, by some, some colleagues of mine who want to be uh, able to go ahead. You should be able to pick up on that. After today's tutorial, you should have enough background knowledge to follow that. And outside PDL and even outside planning, the various models are planning under uncertainty, so uncertainty action that comes in the initial statement. Just generally decision making on in uncertainty. There's lots of research on that early. Earlier, and I believe there's a tutorial later on in the week. Um, tomorrow morning, in fact, morning. on decision making and uncertainty. So do go ahead and, say, uh, and see that. I mean, uh, but for the purposes of today, I've assumed that everything is certain. That's not always the case. And then again, the interesting research questions about how do we capture as uncertainty, what uncertainty are we interested in, and how do we still actually make decisions that make sense, given we have that framework we're working in. If you want to read anything else about what we're doing in the groups, so if you want to follow up and download any planners, or reading the papers, or this, this various video tutorials on there. That's the um, planning group website here. Um, that's me and various of my colleagues who want to put some names to faces on papers. <laughs>